esteemed participants in the conference my dear colleagues ladies and gentlemen on behalf of director general mp idsa ambassador sujan r shanoi i welcome you all to the 13th edition of the south asia conference today this conference has acquired its own gravitas since its inception in 2007 this is an annual calendar event which seeks to strengthen dialogue at the track 2 level over issues of mutual interest we have succeeded in sustaining the dialogue over the years this year the conference focuses on return of taliban in afghanistan implications and way forward which is of interest to all countries in the region and beyond i would now request director general mp idsa to deliver his inaugural address and declare the conference open Good morning. I hope you can all see me and hear me clearly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so let me begin by wishing you all a very good morning from New Delhi. Uh, distinguished participants from different parts of the world, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for us to host the 13th South Asia conference, the South Asian conference uh, at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and analysis. Uh, unfortunately, it is being held online uh, due to the constraints imposed on us by the pandemic. In better times, we hope to see you all in person as in earlier years. Over the years, uh, the South Asia conference has acquired a unique stature as an important track to initiative, bringing together academics, experts, policymakers, practitioners, and media representatives to discuss issues of common interest and concern. This year, despite the webinar fatigue that we all experience, the response to our initiative from the region and beyond has been quite encouraging. I thank all the foreign participants who have accepted our invitation to participate and share their uh, valuable insights. Friends, uh, this year, the theme we have chosen for discussion is uh, you guessed right, return of uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, implications and the way forward. Uh, we deemed it appropriate to focus on this topic because it's an important regional development. Afghanistan, uh, you would all agree, stands at a new inflection point and developments in Afghanistan have a broader ramification for the region and beyond. The return of the Taliban has been widely viewed as a defeat of the US and failure of the 20 year long uh, international effort to bring democracy and peace to Afghanistan. The Taliban have claimed victory, yet there is no gainsaying uh, the fact that the US and its allies have shed much blood and treasure over the past two decades. Uh, not all of that was in vain. The presence of foreign troops did contribute to security for minorities, women and children. Some new standards have been established in popular Afghan society um, on which it will be very difficult even for the Taliban to turn the clock back. If we go by how much even Saudi Arabia has changed uh, over the past two decades, it is not difficult to aver that even the Taliban will have to make adjustments and accept the new realities. Failure to do so would imperil the Taliban's rule perhaps lead to popular unrest in the future and most certainly deny the Taliban the full legitimacy that they seek in the international community. Based on their initial pronouncements, many observers feel that the Taliban would be more moderate in their new avatar. For every such assessment, uh, there is a counter view, the uh, doomsday kind of view that the Taliban will return to their old murderous ways and, and continue to create mayhem uh, backed by an anachronistic mindset. Developments since the takeover have certainly eroded uh, a degree of confidence. Uh, the so-called interim government of the Taliban disregards the minorities, women, and the democratic forces. The members of the Taliban cabinet are anything but moderate and are known offenders of human rights with a record of violence. The minority Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, Nuristanis and Turkmens who together constitute more than half of the population unfortunately account for only 10 out of the 53 ministries today 
And most of these are relatively unimportant ones. There is not a single woman in the list. The international community that was rooting for an Afghan owned and Afghan led system in Kabul is now clamoring for an inclusive government in Kabul. India is a stakeholder in Afghanistan's destiny. We have no choice. Our historical ties with Afghanistan and geographical proximity uh, puts a special responsibility on New Delhi's shoulders. The Delhi Declaration on Afghanistan issued at the end of the meeting held in New Delhi uh, quite recently is broadly on anticipated lines. There are several elements that clearly draw upon the language of the UN Security Council Resolution 2593 of 30 August 2021, adopted under the Rotational Presidency of India. These cover condemnation of terrorist attacks, emphasis on preventing the use of Afghanistan's territory for sheltering, training, planning, or financing any terrorist acts, protecting the rights of women, children, and minorities, and providing humanitarian assistance. The newer elements in the Delhi Declaration pertain to call for collective cooperation against the menace of radicalization, extremism, separatism, and drug trafficking in the region. This is a remarkable common cause that was forged precisely, uh, in my view, because Pakistan was absent from the table. It is well known that all the participating countries have been challenged by one or more of these scourges. With the Taliban now at the helm in Afghanistan for nearly three months, um, perhaps more now, uh, the most urgent task before the global community today is the provision of humanitarian assistance in an open and transparent manner. Afghanistan's coffers are empty. It simply has no means to pay for any imports and the queues for daily necessities are long. Under su such circumstances, the rights of women, children, and the minorities are gravely imperiled. The return of UN and aid workers to Afghanistan uh, should permit not just the monitoring of uh, the distribution of food aid and other assistance, but uh, perhaps also help to check the excesses committed by zealots and criminals uh, on uh, vulnerable sections of society. It will be a daunting task to ensure their safety and security against the backdrop of mounting attacks by an irascible uh, Islamic State Khorasan, which is viscerally opposed to the Taliban. Um, it's an irony of history and a twist of fate that a violent and radical regime is now deemed by an even more violent and radical group to be inadequately violent and radical. Uh, for India, the situation in Afghanistan has major implications. The threat of a spillover of malevolence radiating out of Afghanistan into Kashmir cannot be taken and will not be taken lightly. The Indian Army, no doubt, is fully capable of countering such threats. The priority, however, is to preserve the goodwill earned by India among the people of Afghanistan over many years through capacity building and high impact developmental projects at the cost of billions of dollars. This is reflected in Prime Minister Narendra Modi's remarks at the G20 summit in October, in which he alluded to the friendship that the people of Afghanistan have for India. Both at the G20 summit and the SCO summit held in September, the Prime Minister of India unequivocally indicated India's readiness to deliver humanitarian assistance to Afghan friends, as he put it, in an unhindered manner. The silver lining is that the Taliban are open to the idea of Indian assistance. India, like others, is keen that assistance flows to the people of Afghanistan through the UN uh, with full transparency, without diversion by the regime uh, of such aid and assistance towards its own ends. India has committed to provide 50,000 uh, tons of wheat, uh, essential life-saving medicines, and COVID vaccines uh, to the people of Afghanistan by way of humanitarian assistance. Uh, aid and assistance, uh, such as uh, uh, medical uh, stuff and medicines, has already been sent by uh, the air route to Afghanistan. Hopefully, Pakistan will realize that it is its bounden duty uh, moral duty to facilitate such assistance by India to the Afghan people. Prime Minister Modi himself has given fresh impetus 
to the regional dialogue and efforts to build lasting peace and security in Afghanistan. While receiving the participants attending the Delhi meeting, he succinctly outlined four key aspects that require focus. The need for an inclusive government in Afghanistan, a zero tolerance stance uh, about Afghan territory being used by terrorist groups, a strategy to counter drugs and arms trafficking from Afghanistan, and addressing the increasingly critical humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. A proactive approach has enabled India to actively contribute to the task of building a regional consensus on the future of Afghanistan. Today, no country in the world has yet accorded recognition to the Taliban regime, and not even Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, or Pakistan, uh, all three of which had recognized the Taliban regime way back in 1996. It is up to the Taliban to ensure that their regime becomes a responsible one in tune with the expectations and aspirations of the Afghan people uh, and the global community. I hope that the discussion today uh, and tomorrow, uh, which follows uh, this inaugural session, will deepen our understanding of the common challenges uh, that Afghanistan faces, that the region faces, and also provide suggestions on what the global community, particularly the regional community, should do to ensure a better future for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, they most certainly deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for an excellent introduction to the conference. I'm sure this will set the tone for the conference over the next two days. Before commencing the proceedings of the day, it gives me great pleasure to announce that we have come out with a special issue of the Journal of Defense Studies titled 50 Years Later, 1971 India-Pakistan War. The Journal of Defense Studies is one of our flagship journals and focuses primarily on defense and security issues. I would request the Director General MPIDSA to kindly release the special issue and say a few words about the same. So you are on mute. I was just being very disciplined while you were speaking. I had fully ensured that my mic was on mute. Uh, I have unmuted it. Thank you, Sindhu, for reminding me. Ladies and gentlemen, the commencement of uh, this year's South Asia Conference coincides with Vijay Divas, that is Victory Day. On this very day, 50 years ago, India fought for a just and humanitarian cause uh, and uh, defeated a state that was responsible for the reprehensible genocide of innocent Bengalis in the erstwhile East Pakistan. The war not only led to a stunning and comprehensive victory for India and for the people uh, of uh, East Pakistan. It also saw the birth of a new nation, Bangladesh. The war represents one of the most significant events of the 20th century. It changed national boundaries, and this was achieved over the span of merely 13 days uh, after the commencement of hostilities on the part of Pakistan on the 3rd of December, 1971. The war had far-reaching strategic implications for India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. It gave a chance to India and Bangladesh to work together for the upliftment and betterment of the lives of their millions. Then, as now, Pakistan has had a chance to join the noble endeavor to bring peace and prosperity to South Asia. Regrettably, Pakistan has chosen a different path and sticks to it even today. With the use of unconventional means to disrupt the historical processes of peace and development that are before us, that are already underway in our part of the world. The use of terrorism and support for radical groups, regrettably, is the preferred means through which Pakistan seeks to interact with the rest of South Asia, particularly with India. The 1971 war paved the way for the fullest realization of the aspirations of the people of Bangladesh who had, until then, been artificially suppressed and denied equitable resources. The laudatory progress of Bangladesh since then in every sphere of socio-economic activity 
as indicated by its uh, human resources index, it is a clear reflection of this reality. Bangladesh has succeeded in setting new benchmarks in many spheres for the rest of South Asia to see, to admire, and perhaps to follow. Certainly, we can learn from one another. This special issue of the Journal of uh, Defense Studies, which I'm about to unveil, focuses on the military aspects of the 1971 Indo-Pak War. As we are well aware, wars are not fought in isolation. Other aspects that had a profound impact on the war have also been covered in this issue. I do hope that you will enjoy reading the mega volume. May I take this opportunity now to unveil before you the special edition of the Journal of Defense Studies titled 50 Years Later, 1971 India-Pakistan War. I also take this opportunity to thank the editorial advisory board of the journal, the deputy director general of the institute, the JDS editorial committee, the guest editor, and the associate editor for putting it together in time for Vijay Devas. We will shortly also be bringing out a special issue of our flagship journal, uh, the strategic analysis on a similar theme. It is therefore with great pleasure and satisfaction that I have today released the special issue of the Journal of Defense Studies. Uh, once again, I repeat titled 50 years later, 1971 India Pakistan war. I hope you'll all join me now in uh, unmuting your uh, mics and perhaps uh, attempting to clap with one hand or at least thump your tables. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the release. This special issue is available on the MPIDSA website for free download. Printed copies are also available for sale. For, for more details, you may visit the JDS website webpage on the MPIDSA website. We look forward to receiving your feedback on the special issue. Now, we have come to the close of the inaugural session of the conference. Thank you. We will now begin our first session of the conference. The title of the session is Return of Taliban, a Critical Analysis. May I request DG MPIDSA Ambassador Sujan R. Shanoi to chair the session to chair the first session of the conference and conduct the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Uh, as you know, uh, I have uh, had my uh, share uh, of uh, this morning's events. I've spoken at length on Afghanistan and therefore I shall act very much the part of the chair uh, to be seen, uh, but not to be heard. Uh, and therefore, let me, without much further ado, welcome all our distinguished panelists uh, uh, to the first session, session one, which is uh, devoted to the theme return of Taliban, a critical analysis. And uh, may I begin uh, by simply stating the obvious fact that uh, uh, our panelists are all extremely distinguished people. They are uh, scholars, they are practitioners, uh, and uh, uh, it will be uh, remiss on my part uh, uh, to, uh, you know, leave out the detailed bio data, but in the interest of time, I'm constrained to do so. Uh, the CVs have been circulated. So let me begin by inviting Mr. Loftullah uh, Najafi Zada, Director of Tolo News, uh, to kindly uh, make the first presentation. Uh, each of the presentations will be for 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, I request all other non speakers, including panelists and participants at that stage to kindly keep their mics on mute. If uh, there are any questions, uh, uh, which uh, we will attempt to uh, have the panelists answer at the end of the session, these may kindly be uh, put across to me in the Q and a box, which is at the bottom right of your screen uh, past the chat box. I will not be looking at the chat box, so please kindly do not use the chat box uh, for uh, presenting your questions. Mr. Loftullah uh, Najafi Zada 
uh, a word or two about him. He's an award-winning winning journalist and director of, of Tolo News, Afghanistan's top 24 into 7 news and current affairs television channel. Uh, with this brief introduction, I hand over the floor to Mr. Najafi Zada. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, the floor is yours. I will be a little harsh and impolite in reminding you at uh, about uh, uh, 13 minutes that you have very little time left at that stage. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Chinoy, um, uh, for the introduction and um, and uh, thank you to uh, uh, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis for inviting me. Um, uh, it's an honor to be among friends uh, and uh, to discuss Afghanistan with uh, with with scholars and and, um, um, and friends in India. Uh, India has been um, such a um, a strong supporter of Afghanistan um, throughout. Uh, through thick and thin, uh, particularly in the past uh, 20 years, um, uh, promoter of peace, promoter of tolerance, promoter of democracy. I think India's contribution to Afghanistan's uh, uh, progress, uh, to Afghanistan's transformation, is something that the Afghan people deeply appreciate. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, um, uh, a very uh, strong uh, uh foundation is laid uh although uh as we speak the hour is relatively dark which i'm going to unpack um in in, in this brief um, presentation but uh, it it i'm sure it will not affect uh the uh, relationship between the people of afghanistan and the people of india uh, with that um, uh, note of appreciation, uh, I think uh, let me address um, uh, a few things here. First, um, uh, Afghanistan uh, on August 15 um, turned a page um, and uh, unfortunate that uh, a series of mistakes happened which led us to a full military takeover by the Taliban, uh, meaning that uh, uh, that was uh, from a Taliban perspective and from an American perspective, as well as from Sino Sam Afghan perspective, that was the end of uh, uh, a very long effort for a political settlement. And that means that the Taliban took over the country um, uh, and, and they realized that that was a, a, as a result of uh, a military campaign, not necessarily uh, uh, a political settlement, not necessarily thanks to uh, uh, the talks in Doha or the US Taliban deal per se. So given that that is predominantly the impression that this is a military takeover by the Taliban, uh, that makes it uh, quite hard for the Taliban to um, uh, open up their arms uh, and 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 uh, come up with an inclusive structure in the country. So, I think with that context, the Taliban uh, uh, in in the in the in the in the first hundred days um, um, demonstrated not a lot of willingness uh, to uh, to be very, very frank in uh, embracing other Afghans, in uh, trying to uh, appreciate what Afghanistan has achieved um, in the past 20 years, somehow ignored the fact that the country but, uh, and the society, the people transformed, uh, uh, one of the youngest populations in the world outside Africa, two thirds of the Afghan population under the age of 25. Uh, they barely remember the Taliban time from 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 the from from the last round. So, so I think with that, uh, I think I think the Taliban the Taliban hardly um, uh, appreciated the fact that this was um, uh, this was uh, a transformed country. Uh, but they tried to apply the same rules. They tried to apply the same um, uh, you know governance structure as they did uh, you know twenty years ago. So. So that has resulted in, uh, in, in Afghanistan becoming a pariah state. Um, um, there is no single country, including Pakistan, including Qatar, including China and Russia and Iran, 
who were uh, supposed to be uh, very happy to see the U.S. leaving the country with a bloody nose, uh, have not really recognized the Taliban um, as a legitimate uh, government. And the United States has made it also very clear uh, that uh, the Taliban, um, uh, that the U.S. will not allow uh, um, uh, even one single do dollar to go to the Taliban, let alone recognition. Um, so with inclusivity, I think, I think, I think, I think there, there is, there is an issue. There, there, there is a great issue. Uh, forget about non-Taliban groups, even with, even, even, even groups within the Taliban. Uh, 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 some of them probably more moderate Taliban uh, groups may not feel very much included in the current structure. Security is a challenge. We see more Daesh attacks. Um, uh, uh, the Shias are being uh, indiscriminately targeted. Um, uh, and a number of attacks have happened. Uh, extrajudicial killings uh, you know, are happening throughout the country. Human rights violations uh, are, are on the rise. Um, I, I think I think I think there are a lot, uh, crime is underreported uh, from 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 what we what we hear and see. So 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 definitely this is this is not a peaceful Afghanistan. If if anyone would like to tell us that you know this country is is hundred percent peaceful. On on the economic front, um, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, this is an unfolding catastrophe. Um, uh, uh, we can see um, um, one, one, of the, one of the biggest issues in, in the past few days is the depreciation or the fall of, of the value of the, of, of the Afghan currency. Um, and, uh, uh, and there is, there is liquidity crunch in, 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 in Afghanistan. There, is, there, there isn't cash. Uh, I think people's purchase power has gone significantly down and the prices of inflation has, has gone up. As uh, the winter is very is very uh, brutal and harsh, we had the first snow in Kabul today. Um, um, I think um, I, I think I think uh, the Taliban um, is failing to uh, uh, as, as as rulers of uh, Afghanistan today, failing to uh, to demonstrate any plan um, uh, to see if they can really address the basic needs. As, uh, salaries of empl uh, government employees are not paid. Teachers are not paid. Health workers are not, are not paid for months. It started even started with the Ghani government in in, in, in the last months of the Ghani, Ghani administration. I think I think that uh, you know the chaos chaos had started. So 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 I, I think you know it would be unfair to say that um, uh, if it, uh, um, uh, uh, that pre August 15 um, Afghanistan was was a paradise. No, that was not the case. Um, but but definitely uh, the isolation of the country ha has uh, uh, has suffered has, has made the Afghan people suffer uh, quite quite enormously. Uh, on the humanitarian front, I think um, uh, uh, let me thank India again for for the humanitarian assistance and and thank Pakistan for allowing um, uh, uh, so, so some of, some of the, some of the food to to get to the Afghan people. But let's not forget that that you know we are we are not even in, in the earliest steps of meeting the needs of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the population. Um, 19 to 20 million uh, Afghans uh, face food shortages. Um, um, uh, over 5 million kids uh, are facing acute malnutrition. There are two thirds two -third, two -third of the population uh, are facing with, um, uh, uh, you know, they have no winter reserves. Food reserve for, 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 for winter. So, so I, I so, so I, th I, I think that is that is a, that is um, as as uh, international organizations, including um, uh, ICRC, UN, WFP, and others, have said, this is hell on earth. This is this is something. This is something that uh, uh, this is this is a humanitarian crisis that many have not seen for 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 a very long time. Last is I think um, um, I. I so, so what is next? What are the options? The international community is very much focused on an, on, on a number of things. Number one is counterterrorism. Um, um, uh, how the Taliban will fight Al Qaeda? How the Taliban will fight, or even denounce Daesh and other groups? Uh, um, um, that is also concerns of some countries in the region. 
Um, uh, wh whether whether that partnership is is something real or not, I think time will tell. Second, I think uh, on the agenda for the international community, particularly the West, is um, uh, evacuation and safe passage of those who work for them or with them, uh, or 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 some Afghans that they deem who are at risk. So how um, um, I, I think for the next few months to 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 a year. That would still be, you know, the top of uh, the agenda for 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 Western countries to uh, help um, their affiliates leave the country or those Afghans who who work for them. I mean, there are tens of thousands of those Afghans who are stuck in the country, and most do not even have passports, uh, and the country is running out of uh, of, of passports at, at this stage. I think third uh, item on the agenda for the international community. Is to make sure that you know they address um, uh, the, the basic humanitarian needs. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there is uh, if if there is um, an inclusive um, uh, or 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 a blueprint that everybody agrees upon that how uh, the Afghan people should be helped. At the regional level, I think regional the region is 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 pretty is pretty um, um, uh, I, I think diverse. Um, um, Unfortunately, we failed to uh, create a consensus in the region in the um, uh, in in the past uh, at least ten years or so, and that consensus, even with the departure of Western and NATO forces, is not there. Some countries had some consensus about, uh, or 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 at least they were they were happy that the Americans were were leaving, but I don't think that they are happy what they have uh, what they uh, you know. Uh, what they wished for. Um, uh, I think uh, the consequence is, is is something that even the Iranians have expressed concerns in the converse, in, in the meeting in Tehran. They explicitly mentioned that the government has to be inclusive. Central Asians see Afghanistan from a perspective of fear. There's a fear element in their foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan, and uh, there, there, there's the security concern. But, uh, but, uh, but down deep, I think they are pretty much worried about uh, the future of, uh, of, of the country. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, the Taliban version is, is, is something that uh, they really appreciate. Um, and, 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 and India, I think India has distanced itself uh, quite, uh, quite greatly, um, something that was pretty, um, uh, pretty unexpected. The fact that um, uh, after the fall of Kabul, uh, the Indian government cancelled all visas of, of Afghans. The fact that um, um, uh, as, as India was uh, probably the most loved country in Afghanistan, and it did not allow many Afghans to um, to uh, to seek shelter, probably left some Afghans heartbroken. Um, uh, as we speak among friends, I think it's important to to underline that. Um, uh, but also, I think I think even in in Pakistan, and I, I was there I was there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there are serious concerns. There are serious concerns about uh, whether whether the Taliban would be uh, really um, uh, capable of uh, ruling the country. And as I, as I mentioned, ruling the country. So the Taliban are about rule and control. They are not about governance and, and delivery. And that's where. It takes me to the last point of my presentation is that what is going to happen next? I think the Taliban, the Taliban have to make hard choices. Number one choice is, 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 is for them to, to, um, to bring all Taliban groups under, under, under one umbrella uh, and, and, uh, and try to transform from an insurgency to, to, to a government and to a political group. And once you become a political group, then your con list of concerns um, and issues are much, much larger and greater than just going after people and bombing uh, and planting IEDs and killing foreigners. Um, uh, then you're responsible for 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 um, uh, the population of, of your country, um, uh, especially when you when you're in power. Um, I think I think that is that is still that is still something that the Taliban are, are are struggling. Whether they are still an insurgency, an armed militant group, or they are they are a government. Second, I think I think the Taliban need to address some of the some of the the the, the rights issues, um, um, girls' rights to education, women's rights, uh, free press, 
um, um, I, I, I think I think some of these big policy decisions, you know, have to be made um, uh, sooner sooner than later. And then last for the Taliban, I think the Taliban, the Taliban, who were known for being this very fast decision maker, uh, whether that was uh, in justice uh, delivery, whether that was in um, uh, you know resolving disputes, or even even um, uh, conducting their, their military operations. They are now becoming very, very. They're bogged down in um, um, uh, in, in the process, so they're not really um, uh, fast enough in making in making certain decisions. I don't think the Taliban have a lot of time. I agree with people who 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 who, who uh, think that the winter is going to be difficult for the Taliban, but, but the summer is going to be much, much uh, more difficult. Um, 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 so, 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 so I think the Taliban, you know, has to make certain. Uh, certain choices um uh, and uh, with that, that. with that with, with thank you thank you ambassador with that uh, with that I, I would conclude and i would be more than happy to uh, to see if there are any questions thank you uh, thank you very much mr loftullah najafi zada for your very perceptive remarks and particularly for highlighting the humanitarian crisis that has uh, unfolded in Afghanistan. Uh, the key takeaway for me was what you mentioned earlier on that Afghanistan is a very youthful country and this current generation uh, doesn't quite recall uh, the uh, Taliban in their first uh, incarnation. Uh, and uh, it'll be very difficult to convince the people of Afghanistan that they should uh, regress back to the old ways. And that might uh, call for a great deal more effort on the part of the Taliban if they wish to govern uh, in uh, a normal way. Uh, at this stage, uh, uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Abu Bakr uh, Siddiqui, uh, editor of the RFE RL in Prague. Uh, he is a journalist, uh, author, and research scholar specializing in coverage of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and the surrounding South Central Asia region. He has dedicated the past two decades to researching and writing about peace, security, political, humanitarian, and cultural issues. He's currently with, uh, as I said, Radio Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty in Prague. Uh, so may I turn to you uh, and request you to make your presentation uh, over the next 15 minutes. Over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Chenoy. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to build on uh, what uh, uh, my colleague Lutfullah uh, Najifi uh, Zada said, and my presentation will be more focused on the immediate future of the Taliban. Um, I feel that, oh, oh, I mean, I agree with uh, him that the Taliban are struggling with their primary struggle is um, turning into a government, transforming themselves into a government from an insurgency. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they, they rule, uh, their takeover is challenged by the, this unprecedented economic collapse, uh, which has turned into a humanitarian catastrophe with, um, uh, with expectations and estimates that um, some 23 million Afghans will um, need food assistance already uh, close to 18, 19 million people are uh, needing uh, food assistance. And then, of course, the Taliban uh, are also uh, struggling with um, not being recognized. No state, uh, including the state that previously, uh, as Ambassador Chenoy mentioned, had recognized them. They, uh, those states are even holding on recognizing them. Uh, although uh, pretty much everybody in the world, particularly regional powers, Afghanistan's neighbors, even countries in the Gulf, they are um, in contact with the Taliban. There is a lot, a lot of engagement with the Taliban, but nobody is formally recognizing them. Uh, and then, of course, they have this very complicated struggle with the ultra uh, radical Salafist uh, Islamic State Khorasan. So um, I think one of the big questions for their future is, will the Taliban remain united? Um, if you look at Taliban history, Taliban are kind of a unique organization in recent Afghan history because they have the least amount of 
internal disagreement, internal schisms, um, unlike for example, the other Islamist groups in Afghanistan's recent history, most of the Mujahideen faction, the Mujahideen faction, uh, I mean, pretty much most of them engaged in kind of internal civil wars where there were leadership disputes, there were disagreements with distribution of money and everything. The Taliban, on the other hand, have proved themselves to be very disciplined. Uh, the one fault line that we see after they uh, captured Kabul is between uh, the original Taliban um, or uh, the original Taliban are those networks of the Taliban uh, during the Mujahideen first uh, Mujahideen's war against Soviet occupation uh, from which the basic Taliban uh, organization of Kandahari uh, Taliban emerged in the 1990s. Uh, Mullah Omar and his close associates from southern Afghanistan, they are the original Taliban. And then um, uh, Haqqani, uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani and his supporters or his, um, uh, his very large family, they united, uh, they joined them in the 19, uh, 1996. Um, uh, so uh, even now, I mean, after, during the past uh, 20 years, We've been hearing that uh, Haqqani Network is somehow a separate organization from the Taliban. Uh, the thing is that the two clearly have some differences, particularly between those elements within the Kandahari Taliban who were um, running the Doha office, the Taliban's diplomatic engagement with the world, and those uh, Taliban who were upset with Pakistan after uh, the Taliban, uh, previous Taliban leader Mullah Mansoor was killed in uh, south, southwestern Pakistan in 2016. But at the same time, uh, I think the Taliban have proved uh, themselves savvy enough that they are not going to um, engage in any kind of violent struggle for power, at least for now. We have seen that since taking over, they have um, uh, changed, demoted, and promoted various figures. So the internal power struggle will go on somewhat quietly. It, it is not expected to turn into kind of immediately in the immediate future as something that will be uh, a violent civil war among Taliban factions. But the Taliban uh, have, um, have one uh, key uh, problem, uh, and the key problem is that uh, with the restoration of the Islamic Emirate, they have um, alienated almost all uh, other Afghans. Uh, any Afghan who is not a Taliban is uh, alienated from this government. I mean, there are a lot of talk about um, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan's ethnic minorities being alienated. That's true. But um, uh, the Pashtun majority is also alienated. I mean, secular Pashtuns have no, sp no place in uh, the Taliban government, I can already see that Pashtun, uh, secular Pashtuns are in a way uniting or talking about um, um, uh, a united front to the Taliban. And we, in recent times, we had this, um, uh, in Pakistan, we had this Pashtun Tahafuz movement, uh, which was very critical of uh, Taliban also, both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, particularly. Uh, the Taliban's treatment of civilians. So there is something uh, um, we have seen that, for example, a lot of the killing of former officials, uh, that also happened in, uh, in the Pashtun regions. The Afghan minorities, of course, uh, they are completely, most almost completely um, missing from the government. Their share has um, uh, substant dramatically uh, reduced or even uh, evaporated altogether. Um, and this won't augur well for Afghanistan because Uzbeks, uh, Tajiks, and Hazaras in particular, they are large minorities with, um, uh, in the past 40 years, they had increasingly enjoyed more share in power uh, and, and, and also support from some of the neighboring countries. So that's uh, a key thing that moving forward will hang over Afghanistan. At the moment, we are not seeing any um, uh, armed resistance, but we might see it if there is 
uh, if there is kind of an internal implosion because uh, the economic collapse and the humanitarian crisis are paving the way for this kind of uh, internal implosion. Um, and the Taliban are hands are tied in a way because the Taliban are not recognized. They um, are, I was yesterday, I was uh, watching the Taliban social media and they were very keen on uh, projecting uh, these $20 million that they received from the World Bank as part of uh, this limited unfreezing uh, of World Bank's aid. Um, again, on the um, uh, recognition part, the Taliban have not done uh, a lot that the international community wants them to uh, in terms of their social policies. For example, the Taliban have allowed girls up to six uh, um, grade to go to school from one to uh, through six grade girls can go to school, but they uh, in most provinces, teenage girls still can't go to school. They've segregated uh, a lot of women. Uh, are even if the Taliban claim that they are being paid uh, while they wait at home, but women, are, I mean, uh, are almost completely, they've been um, uh, left out of society. They are uh, being denied any social role. And that's, that, that's again goes back to the point that the Taliban are really good at alienating people instead of winning people. Um, uh, President Karzai has, um, uh, propose this idea of the Taliban holding a lawyer jirga or some kind of deliberation and creating an internal, uh, getting internal legitimacy to gain international recognition. But the Taliban are not, um, uh, appear to be not uh, working on that. I mean, they're, they're working very peaceful. For example, um, with, on relations with India, I mean, this week, one Taliban deputy minister, uh, uh, welcome this limited aid from uh, uh, India and uh, uh, there was a, a plane that uh, brought in some medical supplies and stranded Afghans uh, and he called it a vital relationship. But I'm not sure that the Taliban can uh, really at this point um, uh, build like an independent foreign policy, engage all the regional powers. So um, uh, for the international community, unless the Taliban make some progress on these issues, uh, gain some internal legitimacy, um, um, stop alienating Afghans, um, uh, uh, and, and stop these grave human rights abuses that in some cases are increasing and in some cases are not being addressed at all, they will not get uh, international legitimacy. Um, and then, of course, the Taliban also uh, faces this increasingly violent struggle with the Islamic State Khorasan. Now, it's very important to uh, remember that Islamic State Khorasan uh, in the larger political sense is not uh, a threat to the Taliban because the Islamic State Khorasan is not, does not have an Afghanistan specific agenda. The ISK is violent, it's very well connected, it's made up of urban operatives compared to Taliban's ruler uh, 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 foot soldiers. But the ISK does not have, is not focused on Afghanistan. It's a transnational network. Um, uh, I mean, it's, re, it's part of an organization that all these countries in the region, Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia, China, Russia, everybody consider a major threat to their security and of course the Americans. So the, uh, even while the, the ISK might be able to uh, ramp up attacks, it will not undermine Taliban's legitimacy in the sense that the ISK does not have uh, an Afghanistan specific agenda. If you look at the evolution of ISK inside Afghanistan, almost all of its leaders were not Afghan. Um, they were Pashtuns from Pakistan, or uh, they also had a major part of ISK was always made of Central Asian fighters. So in the near future, uh, they, there is no way that the ISK can, for example, turn into a national resistance movement and um, uh, and, and engage in kind of insurgency that um, uh, will appeal to um, many Afghans, particularly non-Salafi Afghans. Um, uh, and then uh, I don't see, I mean, Iran has absolutely no interest in supporting the ISK in whatever 
circumstances, Iran has by and large a more or less good, uh, a good understanding with the Taliban, although, I mean, it, of course, is stopping short of recognizing the Taliban and Pakistan, of course, has no interest in them. Um, uh, I also see that the Taliban, I mean, there is uh, going to be a lot of speculation and we have heard in the past 20 years, there is narrative that Taliban are nothing more than the Ta Pakistani proxies. The, the, the truth might be a bit complicated. I think the Taliban were, when they were in insurgency, they were really dependent on Pakistani sanctuaries and Pakistanis had more influence o over them. Now, as a government, uh, they, Pakistan's uh, influence uh, has limitations over the Taliban. The Taliban have now direct diplomatic engagement with a number of countries free of uh, Pakistan's influence. Uh, Qatar has, has turned into a major diplomatic uh, hub. It is possible that in the larger regional, uh, greater Middle East divide of Muslim Brotherhood versus the rest or something like that, that the Taliban might be on the Muslim Brotherhood's um, side uh, or on that camp with Turkey and Qatar and everyone. So th that, uh, uh, and also uh, one important development that happened just recently was that the Taliban brokered this ceasefire between the uh, Pakistani state uh, uh, and the TTP, uh, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, and that ceasefire bro broke. Uh, so I think it will give pa Pakistan more reasons to be One skeptical moment, of Pakistan. Of One minute left, please. Okay. So it, it will give more reasons of Pakistan to be more skeptical of Taliban's intention. And of course, the entire Talib Pakistan sentiment remains extremely high uh, inside Afghanistan. So anybody ruling that country will have to be um, attentive to, uh, to that sentiment. Um, in the end, I, I think that um, to conclude, I think the Taliban will muddle through. They, we cannot expect any major um, uh, changes or, or uh, policy changes or posture changes or ideological changes for them. But one critical thing that we don't know about is that how will uh, the Afghan population um, respond if, for example, we see kids uh, dying in large number from malnutrition and the uh, humanitarian catastrophe turns uh, into something that really makes uh, life difficult for a very large number of Afghans. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Abu Bakr Siddiqui. I was just intrigued by a couple of the points that you made towards the end. Uh, on the one hand, you said the Taliban is trying to get legitimacy. Uh, but their current actions clearly do not uh, lead uh, in that direction. Um, and so is this a tenable situation? Because it's going to go on for very long in that case. You also mentioned that the ISK is not a threat to the Taliban, for it doesn't have an Afghan specific, Afghanistan specific agenda. But uh, that does not mean that it is not a threat to the others. Uh, for the very notion of a radical, extreme radical group like the ISK, uh, acquiring some kind of uh, a base or a niche in Afghanistan will have implications for the uh, broader region. And I hope uh, you will agree in the Q and a session. Uh, I think uh, uh, I many of us feel that, uh, uh, you know, if uh, Saudi Arabia could change so much in regard to the rights of women, uh, particularly in recent years, uh, there should be hope. Uh, that one day the Taliban will also realize because, I mean, as we can put it, they cannot be holier than the Pope, you know. Uh, so the um, point here is that we, we will come to the discuss discussion. So I'm, I'm simply moving on uh, using my prerogative as chair, uh, okay. but we'll come to the discussion part later. So all this will be food for thought for the other panelists and and for others who wish to ask uh, uh, questions as well. Um, I now turn to uh, the next speaker, uh, and that is uh, Ambassador uh, Shamsher Mobin Chaudhary, uh, who is uh, a very well known figure. Uh, he's a former uh, Bangladesh High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, he has also served as uh, uh, Bangladesh's ambassador to Germany, Vietnam, and the United States. He's a soldier turned diplomat. He's a decorated freedom fighter, awarded the Beer Bikram by 
uh, his uh, country. Above all, he's uh, a dear friend that I have known uh, since my posting to Peking in uh, 1984. Uh, he was in the same compound uh, as, as uh, the, the compound where I lived, uh, the Chianko Manwai area in Beijing. And uh, I have also seen him uh, during his uh, stint in Vietnam as ambassador. Uh, per chance, of course, I ran into him at a diplomatic party on one of my visits in uh, 1999, if I'm not mistaken. But he is a very well known figure and uh, uh, a lot of us here uh, think very well of him. Uh, ambassador uh, uh, Shamshir Mubin Chaudhary, Shamshir Da, you have the floor now, 15 minutes, no more, sir. Do we have uh, Ambassador Shamshir Mobin Chaudhary, please, with us? All my remarks were love's labor lost. All right, I'll bring him on later. Let me at this stage uh, uh, turn uh, to our uh, next uh, uh, speaker. Again, a, a, a well-known personality. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Aisha Siddika. Uh, she is uh, a PhD in war studies from King's College, London, and author of two books, including uh, internationally acclaimed uh, Military Incorporated, and, and she's uh, an expert in, uh, you know, the military decision-making structures in Pakistan, defense economics, civil military relations, militancy, extremism in South Asia and the Middle East. So you have the floor, uh, Dr. Aisha Siddiqua. 15 minutes, please. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy, <clears throat> for your invite. Um, um, there are three points which I thought I wanted to make, um, and especially after uh, the two earlier speakers who have very good knowledge of what's happening in Afghanistan uh, and with the Taliban. Uh, and I thought that I'm going to spend my 15 minutes looking at what will is the region going to look like with Taliban there? I mean, is there a need to worry? Uh, what are concerns, expectations of the international community, and what is the capacity of the international community to engage with Taliban? Uh, I think that to, to, to start with, I think there are two factors which are important to note. One is that we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, one has heard a lot about pragmatism of, of the Taliban, uh, they're definitely different from the Taliban of uh, the, the earlier incarnation, uh, the Taliban led by Mullah Omar. Uh, <clears throat> the Taliban, which had brought, uh, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden and, 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 and it entertained um, uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, this one is definitely more different. Uh, they're engaging with, with uh, multiple actors. They're very conscious that... Uh, any kind of engagement, uh, any release of resources, they're dependent really on uh, international community for resources. And for that, therefore, they have to uh, tame their behavior. They have to, uh, you know, change their behavior. Uh, it's also a fact that uh, we're looking at an Afghanistan, which is more or less more of a failed state, uh, especially if, if, if it doesn't get the resources. And the threats remain. I mean, uh, we're looking at money and uh, money supply. Um, there is really shortage of money supply. And if it doesn't happen, uh, the two things which the pragmatic Taliban are doing, I mean, their pragmatism has two angles. One is that they are negotiating with the international community, but with the consciousness that the international community is on uh, not entirely uh, on the front foot, but could be put at the back foot with images of starving Afghan, uh, with the image of more chaos in, in Afghanistan, they could actually use those images to their advantage. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, this is also uh, a Taliban, a bunch of people who have been trained in talking to international community like the United States, uh, I mean, let's appreciate that they have very intelligently uh, negotiated and, in, in fact, negotiated what they wanted, in un negotiated on their terms and conditions with Zalmay Khalil Zad and with the U.S. government. Um, 
So <clears throat> there are issues, but you know, um, they, 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 they've also had the successes uh, with, of course, with the help of, of, of Pakistan as well and, uh, and, and the United States, which was willing to uh, kind of accommodate. Um, now, what is, I mean, are we, should we be really worried about the Taliban? Or let me rephrase the question. Should we only be worried about the Taliban? On only in the region. I mean, a lot is happening uh, in the region at the moment. Um, when I look at AFPAC in particular, I mean, I am not encouraged to delink AFPAC at the moment. Uh, that you know, now that Taliban have a separate government, I would uh, still kind of look at AFPAC. And there is a lot of radicalization extremism, which is not of the degree that brought about 9-11, but that extremism and, and, and uh, you know, uh, th that level of extremism is expanding and that kind of failing of the state that uh, you see in Afghanistan, that is also happening in rest of the region, of the AFPAC region. Uh, the forces of extremism, uh, if you look next door in Pakistan, they are equally vibrant. Will you call it? I mean, we could call it impact of the Taliban, but uh, you know, there is a there's a long term impact of the Taliban as long as you know that they're going to be there, as long as there's going to be chaos. I agree that uh, you know, with with earlier speakers, that it's not uh, a walk in the park for the Taliban because um, you know, when when summers come, when spring comes, there there are going to be operations. I'm there's, going to be, there's going to be pushback. Uh, you know, from from Northern Alliance, from from National Resistance. So there's going to be that. But the overall chaos and, and then conflict is going to have impact on the rest of the region. But my my, my uh, argument is that already uh, there the the rest of the region, AFPAC region, is has similar tendencies. Uh, I mean, if you look next door uh, in, in, in Pakistan, from all sorts of religious forces um, have become, have turned more militant. Uh, recently, what we saw with the killing of, of, uh, of, of um, a Sri Lankan um, uh, citizen in, in, in Pakistan, that's just uh, one example of what, uh, you know, what direction uh, the, you know, the overall, uh, you know, the, 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 direction the the social uh, cultural uh, implications but i think it's not just afpac if you look at these extremist values these extremist tendencies that you see I mean across the region in in other parts um, of of south asia as well i mean uh, i would i would think of india i would think of sri lanka so and these different forces are going to play against each other uh, and, and have an impact. Uh, now, what's the concern? What is the capacity of uh, the international community to influence uh, Taliban behavior? We see that uh, what's different is, um, and in a way similar from the earlier incarnation, is that the international community <clears throat> is very cautiously engaging with uh, with the Taliban, they're not entirely engaging with the Taliban, and and yet they are. Uh, Pakistan, which has been very close to the Taliban, and which is uh, one country which has supported uh, the Taliban pro project throughout, even that is not willing to openly uh, recognize. Uh, Pakistan's condition is that unless other countries, inter uh, bigger international countries like United States, Russia, and China do not recognize Taliban, they will not. And, and, and which does not necessarily mean that Pakistan will not provide help, uh, would not uh, be willing to do. And, and right now, when there is a humanitarian crisis as well in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan is doing a bit of heavy lifting uh, as far as uh, you know, providing support, uh, food aid, et cetera, is concerned. And what is most interesting is that this heavy lifting is taking place at a time when Pakistan itself is uh, has shortage of resources, 
where its own economy is in fact in many ways uh, as bad, uh, if not worse than 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 Afghanistan's. I mean, uh, Pakistan's the value of Pakistan's rupee is 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 actually lower than uh, than 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 the Afghani. Uh, so. So how does how does the international community deal with what sh what should be the expectation from the Taliban and in a region in a country which is now in the middle of I mean I don't see stability setting into Afghanistan for at least the foreseeable future uh, there will be conflict there will be uh, you know toing and froing uh, that's going to happen I don't see major democracy uh, you know shaping up. Uh, I don't see a uh, Taliban will be negotiating. So they will bring in minorities. They will bring in some women. They will be uh, negotiating on education, but I do not see, uh, I mean, there is also constituency factor and I do not see that there's going to be a major shift. This is how uh, Taliban are going to, uh, to work. Um, I think the, their self point at this point in time is that, uh, you know, they can, they are better than, uh, and at least this is, this is uh, what Pakistan is also trying to tell the world that they're better than uh, ISK, uh, they're better than uh, uh, Al Qaeda and other extremist forces that operate. Uh, and those, these extremist forces will be there and they will challenge not just the Taliban, but you know, there, there, there is a, uh, you know, uh, a mutual uh, engagement that will constantly happen, which will really affect the character of, of Afghanistan. Um, and, and, and I do not see, I mean, uh, Ambassador Chinoy in, in, in his remarks said that, you know, if Saudi Arabia can change, then why not Afghanistan? And I think it's important to understand that uh, while Saudi Arabia, uh, had its own, uh, you know, a separate identity. And while there is a monarchy, uh, there is a larger constituency and, and, and the environment, the, the, the social cultural dynamics in the AFPAC region is very different. I mean, AFPAC, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and definitely Pakistan, uh, you know, if you, if you extend Pakistan back into Afghanistan, uh, I think what's important to note is that this region has always professed uh, to be carrier of, uh, you know, of of the cultural values uh, which were uh, which which took birth in 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 Saudi in 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 Arabia in the Arabian Peninsula uh, 1500 years ago, uh, and so their understanding of where to take religion, where to take these norms, is very different from. From Saudi Arabia, so that tension will remain. I do not see a Saudi is Saudiization of Afghanistan if that is expected. Um, now, the one question is that what is is the international community? I mean, the, the my last point is uh, while we expect change in um, in in Afghanistan, is the international community itself prepared to? support and and bring about that change and at two levels regional and global i do not see that capacity i mean i, I see that uh, you know at both levels uh, uh, you know we we lack the capacity firstly i think globally uh, if you look at primarily global politics uh, you know look at for example uh, china united states relations uh, what Taliban seem to be doing at the moment is that they are uh, trying to their own advantage, negotiate separately with China, Russia, uh, and also with with United States, with the intention to get as much resources and and uh, you know so that they could it could help them turn them turn into a functional government. Uh, now the problem. What the, the problem that lies here is that right now the 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 um, there is no coming together of these different forces, global forces, to help uh, bring a change in in Afghanistan. So my argument is that the problem of lack of change in Afghanistan is as much caused by international behavior, 
as by, uh, you know, what is happening in Afghanistan itself. Um, so, on the one hand, you have that friction. On the other, you have very quickly, um, if I'm running out of time, Yes, one of the, please, one, one of, yeah, one of the one of the problems is again India Pakistan relationship, um, and and both are at at you know uh, they're trying to counterweigh each other, uh, have separate relationship. Uh, Pakistan's understanding is that India should not be there, uh, should not have an independent relationship with Afghanistan. That is something which is a non-starter. Uh, and, and I think it's very important. I mean, anything for anything, my last point is, if anything has to move Afghanistan in a positive direction, these different forces have to come together and accommodate each other. Pakistan has to understand that it cannot have an independent relation with Afghanistan or use Afghanistan to open up to uh, Central Asia without taking the rest of the region long. Uh, and of course, there is Iran as well. But we, with these complexities, I think what we are looking at is continued uh, friction and problem. Uh, and I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, uh, for your very perceptive remarks. Uh, just a couple of points here again to provoke the panelists uh, because I'll bring them back into the conversation later. Uh, you made some points, and I just want to quickly comment on on them. Uh, you referred to uh, the fact that you don't see Saudiization of Afghanistan. Uh, but I think this is counterintuitive because when you look at Afghanistan historically uh, and the spread of uh, radical ideology there was in, 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 in a, quite a, a, a large measure uh, a kind of facilitated by uh, foreign, uh, you know, Malvis and preachers and, and, and people like that. And so if that influence was so great, uh, in Taliban's first incarnation, why would it not be yes, affected? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the second point, may I request uh, 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 non-speakers to kindly mute their mics, please? Uh, the second point is that uh, well, I can't just the Taliban the will... and I have switched everything okay. else. I'm only using one device, my laptop device now. Mm. Shamshirda, may I request you to mute your mic, please? Uh, um, I will bring you in shortly. Uh, humble request, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aisha Siddiqui, you said the Taliban will be negotiating, will bring in women, minorities, uh, but if they did that, will they lose the internal struggle uh, to the more hardline uh, people? You also said, how does the Taliban, you know, win friends? Will they win friends? I mean, I'm not suggesting remotely that they read uh, Dale Carnegie's 1936 book, you know, on how to win friends and influence people. That's not likely to help in the Afghan context. Uh, but uh, uh, they will obviously have to uh, walk the talk also. Uh, it, it won't help if they don't walk the talk. Um, you know, uh, the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr Siddiqui, had also said something about Pakistan in influencing Afghanistan so long as, uh, you know, the Taliban were an insurgency. But now that the Taliban are a government, uh, Pakistan does not have the same kind of influence. I would beg to defer because in the uh, formation of the government itself, uh, one has reason to believe that Pakistan has played a very big role, uh, but uh, maybe others will chip in on that. And uh, uh, I think Pakistan's uh, uh, sort of refraining from, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, promoting any kind of radicalization today or interfering or recognizing the Taliban is really out of its own self-interest. It cannot afford to do so. If it did so, it will be quickly identified with uh, a certain degree of, uh, you know, radicalization and extremism. So, you know, maybe you can ponder over that. And lastly, you also mentioned that a lot of radicalization is taking place in the AFPAC areas today, but not of the degree uh, that had brought about 9-11. Here too, I would defer because I think the radicalization today aided and abetted by social media is of a more prolific nature, a more insidious nature. The only reason why it's not of the degree uh, as to bring about 9-11 or another 9-11 is because of the great advances that have been made by others uh, for homeland security, including particularly the United States of America. Uh, so I think that is a key factor, but uh, we will draw you in again. At this stage, Shamsherda, finally, you know, I have you, Ambassador uh, Shamsher Mobin Chaudhary, I had heaped fulsome praise uh, on him before he 
uh, actually was able to successfully log in. But let me repeat for the uh, benefit of our listeners that uh, Ambassador Shamsher Mobin Chaudhary is a former Bangladesh High Commissioner to Sri Lanka and a former ambassador to Germany, Vietnam, and the United States. He's a soldier turned, uh, turned diplomat, a decorated freedom fighter, uh, who has been awarded the Bir Bikram uh, by the state of uh, Bangladesh. And above all, he's a good friend of uh, 36, 37 years, 37 years standing. I first met him uh, and befriended him uh, as a neighbor uh, in 1984 in Beijing. Uh, so over to you, Shamshedda. Uh, I hope you have your video on now um, and your audio uh, under your control. And 15 minutes, please. Uh, Penny, for your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Shujan Chinoy. And thanks to I IDSA. Being the uh, tech unsavvy person that I am, I've still not been able to uh, get my camera on, but at least I, I hope I can be heard. And uh, uh, I, I really miss uh, seeing and I was listening to all the wonderful and very informative uh, uh, statements that have been made by many, including yourself, Mr. Chairman, and of course, Aisha Siddiqui, for whom I have a uh, Siddiqa, for whom I have uh, immense respect. Uh, you're right, this is a historic uh, day for us uh, Bangladeshis, for uh, our friends in India. Uh, five decades ago on this very day, we liberated our country from the occupying Pakistan army and 3 million lives were lost in the process. A lot of suffering had uh, to, people had suffered a lot. So on this day, I convey my sincere uh, gratitude to the government uh, and the people of India for what they had done. I extend to you my very sincere greetings uh, uh, on this uh, very, uh, I had not really uh, believed that I would live to see 50 years of an independent Bangladesh because I was supposed to be tried in a military court and given the death sentence and I was even have the charge sheet that was given to me for inciting mutiny and for treason and I still have that charge sheet with me. Uh, we are not talking uh, on this occasion and I, I thank IDSA for a very timely uh, uh, event to talk about a neighbor uh, closer to India, closer to Pakistan, not so close to Bangladesh, but within our same neighborhood, and a fellow SARC member. The, at the time when Afghanistan became a SARC member, things were looking very, very promising for Afghanistan, in spite of a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges, issues of corruption, governance issues, and all there. But even we thought that Afghanistan had was moving towards a situation where Afghanistan would be able to play uh, a very meaningful role that a country uh, in our neighbor with a population of about 40 million and have would have much to contribute uh, to South Asia uh, as a group. And that is why uh, Afghanistan became the eighth member of SARC. Things then, uh, since then things of course, and more recent time things have changed dramatically. Um, I would, at this point of time, one can say that only thing certain about Afghanistan is uncertainty. And we are seeing this uh, uh, evolve uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the state of uncertainty continues. Um, and this is, uh, I, I think, I find it rather unfortunate because as a very junior foreign service officer in the 19, early 1970s, 70, I think it was 74 or 73, when then president, uh, sorry, 75, then president of uh, Afghanistan, uh, President Daoud had visited Bangladesh. Now, as a protocol man, of course, I was not uh, part of the substantive dialogue that was going on between President Daoud and our then prime minister and father of our nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib uh, But uh, being the fly in the wall, uh, as all protocol officers are, uh, I could, uh, have uh, direct access to the conversation that was going on between these two uh, leaders, our great leader and also the <clears throat> then president of Afghanistan. And I got the feeling that we're talking of a peaceful, prosperous uh, uh, South Asia working together, the region Afghanistan and Bangladesh working together. Uh, both the countries were had a very positive, progressive mindset. And this the, the message that was coming across was 
uh, let's uh, you know uh, keep uh, 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 our close relations open and, uh, and and we move forward now bangladesh for bangladeshis of course afghanistan had a very very special place historically of course bangladeshi writers have been to afghanistan my own uncle has been to afghanistan many 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 years ago and written about afghanistan but in 1973 when thousands and thousands of Bangladeshis were being repatriated from Pakistan to Afghanistan. The airline that was used was the Afghan airline called Ariana. Now, I'm sure many of our Afghan friends would still remember the name Ariana. The UN had chosen Ariana of Afghanistan to ship these people, thousands and thousands of the families, and children, etc., from Pakistan to Afghanistan. So Afghanistan at that time looked like everything to be a very positive, uh, uh, you know, force in the region. And, and, and that looked, uh, uh, you know, wonderful at that time. Things, frankly, as in my own view, uh, things changed dramatically uh, with the Soviet invasion of 1979. And I think that went the long period of uncertainty, suffering, instability uh, began to take roots. Now, President Ronald Reagan at that time uh, looked at the Mujahideens as uh, a, a, an enemy of my enemy, so he used them. In the end, uh, a major section of the Mujahideen turned uh, to forces that was not palatable to any one of us, any one of our countries, any one, or to the global society as a whole, who sought to see uh, an Afghanistan that does not turn violent. But it did. And if I read Steve Cole's uh, brilliant book, Ghost Wars, you'll see the, how the American foreign policy in Afghanistan was being dictated totally by uh, uh, energy requirements of the United States. Because Steve Cole says in his books, it was like Unipol uh, choosing uh, with which force the US should ally itself with, not with the Northern Alliance, but because they wanted that pipeline, the oil pipeline to go through. So we have gone through all that. Now, uh, a number of, uh, of course, everybody is now wondering what is for the future of Afghanistan and what is for the future of our region as a whole. You know, proxy states are, are never a comfortable thing to deal with. Now, I've got the, the, the uh, military takeover of, uh, of Afghanistan by the Taliban happened a few months ago. But till this day, the Taliban government does not enjoy international recognition. And this is something that we have to uh, you know, keep in mind, that it is not a recognized setup that is running the affairs of state uh, in Kabul or in Afghanistan. Now, the pullout of the US-led NATO forces from Afghanistan created a large vacuum in security, economic situation, financial management, social understanding, and many other discourses. Everything kind of looked collapsed. And the Afghans were not prepared to run a country, especially because it was still a, not an inclusive setup. And the idea is to create an Afghanistan that is, that is inclusive, that, re, that represents the uh, mind of the Af Afghan people and the legitimate representative of all the people of Afghanistan. It is a very divided society. It has very powerful you know, tr domestic tribes. And, and, and it has. What is also worrisome that the Taliban has taken over. I mean, they walked into, the, into Kabul and the presidential palace with ease, with, without any resistance. Whereas we in 1971 had to enter Dhaka, uh, you know, fighting the Pakistani forces. So, having done that, the early promises that the Taliban had made, or I wouldn't say promises, but more like assurances that Afghanistan, the Taliban had given. Uh, of an inclusive uh, administrative setup, an in inclusive society, uh, women being able to go to school, uh, there will be, Afghanistan will not be source of uh, uh, terrorism coming out of there. But none of that has happened until now. None of that has happened. Uh, the question that remains is uh, Afghanistan again becoming a sanctuary for regional terrorism. It's a very valid question. Uh, there are some other factors which may be important uh, role here. The Khorasan province, for example, the Haqqani network, Tariq-e-Taliban, Pakistan, 
not in line in some of the smaller groups. So they, the whole mix, and some are more palatable than others, or some are less palatable than others. So I think we we see an Afghanistan which which is uh, which is uh, in a state of uncertainty and a state of instability. At the same time, Mr. Chairman, and to my Afghan friends here and to all, I think a failed Afghanistan will be a source of instability. We have to keep that in mind for the region with far-reaching geostrategic and socio-economic implications. And this is something we really, really have to keep in mind. So Afghanistan is already a, a experiencing the dire effects of a financial meltdown, uh, an ideal environment for radicalization and terrorism to thrive. This is dangerous and alarming. Furthermore, neighboring states have already engaged in a regional competition which will only compound the negative impacts on stability. Pakistan, Iran, Central Asian countries, and India are engaging uh, in the situation. And uh, well, there's also the emerging role of China uh, in the neighborhood. So any involvement with the Taliban uh, or with the present uh, setup in Afghanistan has to be on a purely objective basis, not a self-serving one. If any of these forces <laughs> engage Afghanistan or the Taliban for a, for a very uh, narrow, self-serving goal, it will not serve the purpose. Uh, I think the role of major powers like China, Russia will be of importance. Depends on what kind of role they want to play. Uh, if they're look, only looking for strategic locations there or what we've heard used to be called a strategic depth, I think it could be counterproductive in the long run. Uh, we also do not know, uh, going by past experience, we do not know the lifespan of the Taliban. You know, they were there in the, in the 90s, they didn't last very long. Uh, they are here now, I don't know how long they will last, uh, what the threat, threats are there for people. Now, uh, uh, it should not become the battleground for major powers, uh, as it was previously. Rather, it is the responsibility of all these powers and regional players to ensure a stable Kabul emerges in the interest of the security of the wider region. A battle should be for the Afghan people, and that is what we should work for. I will just conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman, with some key points that I think we should keep in consideration. Uh, A, we need to monitor the situation in Afghanistan very carefully and closely, because whatever happens there has direct implications and bearings on South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and beyond. The fluidity of the situation makes it difficult to assess from outside. So maybe there may be a need to engage inside. It is important for us in South Asia, in particular, to understand the complexities of the developments. The other point is the international community must engage in Afghanistan to save its people from the looming humanitarian uh, disaster and the country's uh, survival, uh, uh, with the very basic survival, let alone progress. Historically, of course, many have tried to venture to Afghanistan to rule. However, none of them could last, perhaps due to the failure to understand the Afghan people's psyche expectations. There was no sense of humility, social understanding, and religious beliefs. Uh, some of the key actors, notably the United States and the allies, uh, China, Pakistan, India, Iran, uh, will have influence on what is going on in the future. So they must remain engaged. And uh, I'm not calling for recognition as such, but they must remain engaged to save people in Afghanistan and the Central Asian countries who are neighboring Afghanistan. The regional organizations have a bigger role to play for a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan should not be in the hyphenated relationship of the India-Pakistan rivalry. I mean, this is something very, very different. We should look at Pakistan, should not look at Afghanistan as their proxy and as their source of, uh, you know, creating disturbances in, in, in India and other and the other regional countries. Uh, it is not economically feasible to extract much of the mineral resources. I mean, okay, there are talks of Afghanistan is the center for mineral resources. It is very, very, it's a mountainous region. It can take years before you learn to even begin to extract these resources. So there is a much bigger game, long-term game some are playing. But there has to be a convergence of goal, a convergence of thought uh, 
in order to move forward in the interest of Afghanistan and in the interest of a stable, peaceful Afghanistan that does not become a source of terrorist supply, but and which has implication in uh, the broader South Asian region and the, the, part of the Central Asian region and, and, and even beyond. Uh, uh, it is not economic, uh, it has implication for the use of geoenergy and geoeconomics along with social implication. Uh, frankly, uh, an Afghanistan that is currently in a situation that favors violent extremism, Bangladesh needs to remain with our country, Bangladesh, which has had a long relationship with Afghanistan. We remain to remain to vigilant and, and to protect ourselves from this menace because there has been the odd Bangladeshi who had lined up with, uh, you know, the Haqqani group, the other terrorist examination, the IS elements that are there. And uh, so we need to see that uh, uh, we all work together to create a peaceful, not necessarily in a competitive manner, but in a manner that is uh, uh, that is uh, brings out the best from Afghanistan and in Afghanistan in every, everybody's interest. The situation is fluid, very, very fluid. And there is every, uh, every reason, I wouldn't say every logic, but every reason why the international community has not yet recognized the Taliban government. Uh, well, I don't know if it's called the Taliban government, the Taliban setup. They have not been able to deliver the right message and right assurances to, to other countries, which can facilitate a more serious and institutionalized Engage. I know there have been the Doha group meetings, but how much impact is it having on the mindset of the Taliban? They have actually gone back to many of the things. At this stage, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, uh, like to end my presentation and I seek your indulgence uh, because today is Victory Day. We have a whole range of events going on. The Indian president is here uh, as a freedom fighter. I've been invited to meet him tomorrow. And for that, I need a RT-PCR test and everything else that goes along with it. We live in a situation where we spend more time in laboratories getting RT-PCR tests. So if you'll excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'll have to take leave of the seminar. Wish you all the best and, and wish the, the seminar all the best. IDSA has been a great institution for bringing out very key issues of interest to all our countries. And once again, my sincere heartfelt greetings to all the participants, all our countries, the people of India, the government of India, the soldiers of India who laid down their life for our liberation that we achieved on this very day. Thank you very much, Ambassador John. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shamsher Mobin Chaudhary, for your participation. And we do recognize the fact that uh, you have other things to do uh, 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 today at, at your end. Uh, before I move to the next speaker, uh, move on to the next speaker. I just want to make three, uh, two or three brief comments on what Ambassador uh, Shamsher Mubin Chaudhary just said. I think the key takeaway there was that whatever the regional uh, stakeholders do, whatever other countries do, should not be self-serving in Afghanistan, and that it should uh, really have at uh, the heart of uh, its objective uh, the uh, you know improvement in the situation. Uh, for the people of Afghanistan, for if it is self-serving, uh, it is bound to, uh, you know, uh, sort of fail. Uh, and that Pakistan should not look at Afghanistan as a proxy. Uh, above all, that uh, the regional community, the global community needs to monitor the situation in Afghanistan for it's uh, not like uh, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. In this case, what happens in Afghanistan has great implications uh, for the rest of us. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Obaidullah Bahir uh, to make his uh, remarks, uh, to give us his presentation uh, over the next 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Bahir is a lecturer of international relations from Afghanistan. He has lectured at the uh, American University in Afghanistan and the Kardan University. He is currently a visiting scholar at the New School in New York. He also currently leads a welfare campaign attempting to fight the uh, humanitarian crisis uh, that is emerging in Afghanistan. Over to you, Mr. Bahir, uh, over the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, do please kindly unmute yourself. Uh, I'm sorry, I've done that in a lecture as well. I spoke for half an hour only to realize that my students were sleeping on the other end. 
Um, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having such an esteemed panel. I will quickly dive into the matters and the points that I want to discuss just to quickly brush upon um, certain issues that have been raised so far. Um, um, with all due respect to what um, the ambassador from Bangladesh said, um, I think claiming that the Taliban have failed at issues such as securing the general region are very long term goals that should not be um, rushed. Um, again, that being said, the Taliban have committed certain blunders, um, but we have to also contextualize it in seeing how the Taliban are very new to this governance thing, especially the newer generation, especially the newer Afghanistan that they are expected to rule. Um, I'd written to the Associated Press um, a month before the fall, and I was asked as to what the strategy was. Um, and I'd said that the strategy looked like um, that the patrons of the Taliban were expecting them to uh, put pressure on Kabul, uh, probably even get to the borders of Kabul, and then expect a democratic transition of power. That was very important for the patrons as well, the states that were sponsoring the Taliban, because that way they could create a setup in which they could use counterweights to balance out the Taliban and coerce them into behavior that was required. Now, what happened instead was when the Taliban reached the boundaries of Kabul, the regime collapsed unexpectedly. Uh, the Taliban emerged as total victors of a military campaign. Now, that's problematic, especially for sponsor and patron states, because then the Taliban achieved this sense of uh, ego and pride uh, with regards to having achieved their victory themselves. And we've seen that behavior recently from the Taliban's part as well with re regards to not, not complying with off them, the relationship with Iran, despite Iran investing so much in the Taliban is very strained. Uh, the Pakistani regime keeps complaining that the Taliban does not really adhere to what is expected or demanded of it. Um, Siddiqui said talked about the ISK threat. I think the ISK threat has two ways of viewing it. One is the internal uh, challenge that they pose. It's not necessarily about the uh, goal and the overlapping of those goals. The idea is that the ISK represents a very viable alternative to Taliban fighters who are disappointed with the movement, which means the only thing that keeps the Taliban becoming more rigid or adhering to specific um, ideology that they came in with is their fear that ISK would always use itself as a catching net for any defectors from the Taliban movement. And we've seen um, Taliban uh, commanders turning to the ISK at the time when the peace talks were at their peak, um, and even now when they think that a specific policy is un-Islamic. Um, there's also a specific nuance to the whole Saudi Arabia and Taliban argument as well, and that's on two levels that I wanted to highlight. One was the idea that Saudi Arabia, though is viewed as a theological state, always had a separation of church and state. The fact that the Saud family and uh, uh, the Abdul Wahhabs, they divided amongst themselves the matter of matters of state and, and religion, um, which meant that the authorities in charge could always have more leeway with regards to how they conducted themselves. On the second end is the abundance of natural resources and, and funds to the elites of the state in Saudi Arabia, which means that they're not that heavily reliant on their, um, their followers. The idea that the Taliban, though an authoritarian regime right now, they do have a social contract, but that social contract is to their own fighters. Um, that being said, I just wanted to quickly cover the point of um, what engagement or dialogue the Taliban should look like. Um, and this dialogue is obviously on two different levels or stratas. One is the international community's engagement with the Taliban, and the second is um, the Afghans' engagement with the Taliban, because we have to realize that there is a group within Afghanistan, a healthy number that does not see eye to eye with the Taliban. Those are probably the urbanites, the educated elites that demand better. Um, of course, if we look at the um, 
events that led to the eventual takeover of the Taliban, there is a lot of blame to go around and uh, we can delegate that uh, accordingly. And the allies ended up um, signing a peace deal with the Taliban. They gave them the legitimacy, the United States and its allies. Um, the fact that there was a narrative going on that um, was further reinforced by the United States, the whole narrative of the impending victory, um, the fact that the United States kept predicting that the regime was going to fall, that the uh, security forces would not be able to sustain the fighting, that gave a hit to the morale of the fighting uh, that um, it really um, could have done without. Um, on the other end, obviously, the Republic <coughs> had its own faults as well, despite the corruption, despite all the other factors. The fact that <coughs> to them, this fight reached a point where it was about going together into the abyss, and that is the final escalation level that a fight can go to. Um, and the fact that they chose to walk out on the country, the military institutions integrating, the political institutions being um, messed up, uh, that shows you as to how um, it had become so personal to them that they would rather see it all burn than hand it over to the Taliban. Um, the problem with Afghanistan is 20 years of fighting is a long time and it creates an intractable conflict. At the core of such intractable conflicts is uh, the othering. Um, and that othering necessarily meant that um, the Taliban viewed everyone else that wasn't on their side as people who had chosen to align by um, the foreign agendas. On the other end, if we saw, if we specifically look at the past two years of the Republic, the Republic heavily relied on this narrative of othering the Taliban, making them look like they were agents of Pakistan and that they were here to um, occupy Afghanistan. That did serve them well. Unfortunately, they were using it to hide their own incompetence as well, uh, which was problematic. But in the longer run, this othering on both sides meant that when Afghans came face to face with the Taliban, um, there was a lot of work to do. And um, um, Aisha already talked about the social hierarchy in their head as well that became problematic with regards to us in exchanging ideas and being able to engage in constructive dialogue with the Taliban. Uh, but I think we have to also understand the Taliban as well as an imaginary community. Uh, the fact that they have symbolic processes like flag, like <clears throat> an identity uh, that unites them, we all realize that Within all of that, the Taliban were very loosely linked to the fact that the Haqqani network can be mentioned as the Haqqani network within the Taliban framework shows you that there are many such groups and commanders that had contributed to the fighting, but they had, weren't really on the same page, which is why it took them more than a month to have a discussion with regards to the division of the cabinet and what the government looked like. Uh, um, so it's a painful and long a, process for the uh, Taliban. Uh, Mr. To Mr. Bahir, sorry to interrupt you. There uh, is a bit of a problem with being, your bandwidth. Uh, may I request you? Hello, Mr. Bahir. May I request you to kindly mute your video and devote your available bandwidth to your audio? May I request you to kindly mute mute your video? The available uh, bandwidth will then be there for the audio. Thank you. We are having a little problem with your audio. That, that, okay. Please, please Sorry, continue. I thought I thought I thought you were going to tell me to change my country, but I was like, unfortunately, I can't do that. This is the internet that's available. <laughs> but, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, thank you for what having us. Yes, what I meant was simply mute your video so that the available bandwidth yeah. no, no. can be used for the audio. And please carry on now. Please carry on. Thank you. So, so with regards to this imagined community, like we have examples within history as well, with regards to the stolen children of Uganda, the Janissaries of Turkey. These are people who, even if they don't belong to a specific group, when they spend enough time with it, they start identifying with it and start belonging to it. And why I mentioned that the idea of imagined communities is very often in order to communicate with such groups, you have to have some sort of common grounds with them. Um, and that means that this whole othering that has happened throughout the years has to be reversed in which that the Afghans can relate to the Taliban and the Taliban in return can acknowledge them. And on the other end, you have to have the international 
community creating some nuance to interaction with the Taliban. What does that mean? Communities have specific sacred values. Like um, there are certain ideas that they are willing to discuss in the open. There are other ideas that are so core to their identity that they feel challenged by it. Now, the reason I mentioned the ISK threat was to give context to that. Now, the Taliban their fear is that they are answerable to their fighters and their vision of the world. If they betray that, they lose those fighters to ISK. Now, what is then the way forward? It's quite interesting and sad, honestly, to see how the international community understood this problem. The fact that with the Taliban during the negotiations with the United States, the United States was more than willing to shut the door and sit down behind closed doors and have a discussion. The fact that the US and Taliban peace deal has appendages none of us has ever seen also shows that the, the United States understood the limitation of the Taliban with re regards to their reputational cost of compliance to anything. Why is that same sense not prevailing right now? Why can't the international community and regional players approach the Taliban through track to diplomacy? Uh, why can we not have backdoor channels to the Taliban and discuss ideas that would be problematic for them to discuss in the open? Um, now, that being said, um, the problem at the core of all this is the fact that we are barely entertaining any gray areas or like, honestly, we're looking at a scenario where there are zero shades of gray. The fact that we look at everything as binary decisions and the international community and regional players look at the Taliban and think that they have to choose between sanctions and recognition, right? Which is not fair because the dichotomy is 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 untrue. There are a lot of levels in between in which the engagement can happen that can be constructive to both the region as well as the Taliban. So if we sit down with the Taliban and the conditionality of aid doesn't necessarily have to be announced, there could be ideas where release of funds is dependent on specific compliances from the Taliban. There could be monitoring bodies on the ground that monitor that sort of compliance and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, the problem then also exists for Afghans as well. Afghans like myself who have to choose between who are, are made to think that the choice is between servitude or resistance to the Taliban. Even though there are options in between in which you cooperate with a certain totalitarian regime, but you also resist in a way that shows them that you are unhappy and that your grievances are piling up. Um, and it's a very difficult decision. Obviously, if they've gone through the othering, we have gone through it as well. And the question there is, do you hate the oppressor or do you hate the oppression? Oftentimes you hear this narrative of comparing the Taliban to the Nazis, how cooperation is futile and immoral. Um, and th so there's a lot of ethical debate in there that the Afghans within Afghanistan are currently entertaining and we're trying to maneuver um, around. So, but uh, as uh, while concluding, all of what I've said, and I do understand that uh, very solutions might not be perfect solutions available to us. Else, the Taliban are in a position which forces them to comply to a larger extent than they would have otherwise. Uh, um, for starters, we accept better bitter realities. The Taliban are an unfortunate reality that have come up upon a fund in the region. Are there any alternatives? There was a foreign minister a member in Iran, a director who said that the choice was between a snake and a scorpion in hell. Between Taliban. the fact that the alternative is there is civil war, the alternative is further turmoil. And again, the spillover effects have already been highlighted by his ambassador, um, by his excellency, the ambassador. So um, what do we do moving forward? So what happens for the region um, is, uh, uh, more focus on track to diplomacy. You do not have to officially endorse the Taliban, but there are ways of sitting with them and getting cooperation from them. The Indian fear that the Taliban are deep in the pockets of the Taliban might not really hold true because the Taliban are exploring partnerships right now, and this could be a good opening to transform 
policy for the Taliban with regards to Afghans within Afghanistan. What we are trying to do in which we we would need support. Well, we are seeing uh, which Taliban start challenging us, which is a in and and general communities engagement with us. To be because again, the problem of bringing if the international community focuses on us and, and consider us as their representatives in this dialogue, it strips off an ability to identify the Taliban and really communicate with them. Um, so, what happens is, in regards to aid work, we are empowered, and then at some point, understand that even with regard to diplomacy. Very often, Afghans should be the middle people here that interact with the Taliban that invite them to specific events in which they can hear what the world expects of them and what they can do. So currently, yes, Afghan are uh, uh, failing at quite a few avenues with regards to government, but it creates opportunities. They do understand the desperation that they're in with regards that's our counter the bond in uh hours so if the day there's dialogue the better of honest of a challenge region internet are we Define about behavior can you hear me? I think we have also lost can you hear me Hello, can you hear me ambassador? Yeah, I was done. I was almost done anyway so i've uh, I was just concluding that the international community needs to uh, figure out nuance of engaging with the Taliban and, life, so. and empowering uh, the local Mm. Uh, I take it you're finished, Mr. Mr. Bahir. Yes, I am. I th thank you very much. In fact, it's unfortunate that in the last minute or so we had uh, a bit of a problem with the audio uh, because you were making some, uh, you know, uh, very uh, uh, pertinent remarks. Uh, also, a little bit of out of box uh, thinking. And I'm intrigued by your uh, uh, frequent referencing to the, in, the impediments caused by this, you know, mental uh, uh, sort of uh, idea that we have of the other, as in the othering, as you called it. Uh, you, you referred to othering between the Afghan, previous Afghan government and the Taliban and how it has, uh, you know, slowed down the effort to reach some kind of a consensus uh, in the country there. Um, there is... Uh, one point I wanted to make uh, here is that uh, uh, one of the reasons that the U.S. was quite happy to negotiate behind the doors with the Taliban, but uh, as you said, not quite ready to do the same or to lead the international community to do the same, uh, you know, now that the Taliban have taken over, could also be because the U.S. actually lost face. Uh, so having extracted itself through those uh, private negotiations in which they might have said and done whatever they did. Uh, I would imagine it's logical for them now to be reluctant to do so publicly, uh, given the kind of criticism that has been heaped on them and their 20 years of, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, sacrifice as they see it themselves. So I, I'm not quite sure why they would want to suddenly come out and say all that publicly also. It'll be hard to do that. And the fact that the world is today now involved in a summit of democracies and there is a new narrative now about uh, the importance of democracy is going to make it that much harder for the Taliban to normalize itself or mainstream itself. Uh, your references to, you know, making a distinction between the oppressor and the, uh, you know, um, and, and oppres oppression per se, it almost sounded Gandhian to me uh, and hopefully uh, you know, this is also going to ultimately mean winning the hearts and minds of the Taliban. How we do it, I suppose, is uh, another challenge. 
uh, whether it's track two or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, closed door conversations uh, at the government level. This is really up for the uh, experts and policymakers to to decide. Uh, now we will use the remainder of our time uh, to look at the Q and A box. I'm doing that as we speak. I request all other panelists uh, to also check the Q and A boxes. It's to the uh, bottom right corner uh, beyond the uh, signs that say participants and chat. Then there are three uh, dots there. You click on that, you'll see the Q and A box. Please uh, bring it up onto your screen uh, as I try to make some sense of the questions that I poured in. Um, Sahil Swami uh, comments, India's policy towards Afghanistan has been way too diplomatic. It seems um, rather like a direct in indulgence. Um, I, mean, I can't really make sense of this question, but I think the essence of it is that uh, it has been way too diplomatic. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps people will comment on that. Uh, Dr. Adil Rashid from our institute, uh, who works on uh, CTCR issues and is well known in that field, uh, says, what are the chances of the Taliban falling between two stools in seeking to woo the international community? Um, it would make enemies with its erstwhile jihadist friends, leading to more radical forces taking over the country. This is of a piece with what the last speaker also said. That were the Taliban to sound too, uh, you know, gentle and and accommodating of the minorities and 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 stuff like that, uh, they're going to lose their fighters uh, to the more radical vision of Afghanistan. Um, Mir Nazir of uh, our institute uh, has a question for Mr. Loftullah uh, Najafizada. Uh, he says, as you mentioned, there are some killings and prosecutions uh, by the Taliban after the takeover. Is there a lack of communication or trust between the top leadership and the Taliban members on the ground? Uh, the foot soldiers, he means, um, because the top leadership in his view tries to appear moderate uh, uh, at the moment. How well, how connected is the Taliban top leadership with the uh, foot soldiers in particularly in far flung areas? Again, uh, Mir Nazir wants to uh, pose a question to Dr. Aisha Siddika. Um, how is the radicalism in the AFPAC region going to impact or influence the Taliban narrative? Will the Taliban use it to strengthen their control or will they try to distance from it to gain international legitimacy? Dr. Anand Kumar of our institute, uh, uh, says reports indicate that the Taliban is creating a regular army. Can this be seen as the beginning of building a Taliban state? Would the Taliban succeed in other areas of uh, uh, that is nation building, building state institutions? Uh, Jason Walang of our uh, institute has a question for Mr. Abu Bakr Siddiq. Does the historical power struggle between the Tajiks and the Pashtuns further complicate the formation of an inclusive government in Afghanistan. Again, Dr. Anand Kumar of our institute uh, asks, what kind of situation is likely to develop in Afghanistan if the present economic crisis persists? Uh, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar um, asks, especially to our Afghanistan, uh, Afghan panelists, would they kindly identify and name the Taliban figures who had first entered the presidential palace in Kabul immediately after the fall of the capital uh, with the flight of the former president, uh, that is President Ghani. Um, now, what I intend to do is uh, in the same order in which I had requested uh, our panelists to speak, I will um, give the floor to each one of them uh, to react to firstly, uh, all that was said by the other panelists uh, or by me in terms of you know commenting on what you had said and secondly uh, to also reflect on the questions that have been posed you may also feel free to comment on questions that are not directly addressed to you i think uh, since we have time until uh, 12 30 pm i was told so by the uh, team that has put this uh, event together uh, we will be a little generous uh, at this stage and uh, 
would you agree that we give each one of you five minutes or so? Uh, and then maybe I'll also draw in uh, one or two others uh, at my discretion. Uh, so over to you, Mr. Loftullah Najafizada. Another five minutes uh, for your remarks. He, he's not there, it seems. All right. Uh, perhaps you can try and bring him back into the uh, conversation. Uh, in that case, I turn to Mr. Uh, Abu Bakr uh, Siddiqui. Mr. Chinoy, um, I think if I remember rightly, you wanted to uh, me to address a couple questions about the Taliban changing posture and um, I mean, when you talk about Taliban, you have to um, realize uh, or I mean, uh, you have to understand that that one of the key struggles that the Taliban are now facing is that uh, they are uh, trying to come up. They have to balance between the expectations of the Afghan population and the international community on what foot soldiers. They have uh, radicalized these people to fight in the name of Islam, to even commit suicide bombers, to do acts of extreme violence. Now, suddenly they cannot turn and tell them that everything we told you was just to win the military war and you should not, no longer practice these ideas or believe in these ideas and we are going to turn democratic. We are going to allow, uh, for example, uh, women rights, full women rights, and also uh, we are going to um, allow some kind of um, um, representative pluralistic government. So that's, I think, a key struggle for them, keeping their own ranks disciplined, internal unity, balancing the interests of the different uh, groups uh, within the Taliban or or leaders or whatever, I still believe that I mean this idea of uh, for 20 years we have been talking about um, multiple Taliban um, organizations or organizations between the thing between the Taliban within the Taliban. But I mean they have proved that they are a lot more united than many, if not all of the Afghan political or military organizations we have seen. Sorry, I want to draw you out a little bit on this uh, in yes. this conversation. Now, when you talk about, you know, the Taliban being reluctant to renege on the vision that they had presented to their foot soldiers, at this stage, they cannot turn their back on it. Uh, now, why doesn't the OIC or a clutch of important Islamic uh, countries play a role in this in terms of giving the uh, Afghan uh, regime uh, and their foot soldiers a chance to understand uh, that vision better. After all, that vision is embedded uh, and anchored in uh, certain interpretations also of what an Islamic Emirat should be. Uh, so isn't there a role here for Saudi Arabia or for the likes of Turkey, uh, 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 others perhaps even uh, you know, from Southeast Asia, Malaysia, all the active types in the OIC can come well, together well, and and tell them what what they ought to be. Why well, is that the, not possible? No. Uh, the thing is that broadly, I mean, the international community is uh, what the international community is doing or has so far done in terms of its engagement that um, it is punishing the Taliban uh, by not recognizing them, by not dealing with them, by not giving them aid um, because of these uh, retrogressive policies, I mean, the restrictions of women, extrajudicial killings, the lack uh, of a constitutional legal structure in Afghanistan and all of that. Um, I feel that the other Islamic organizations or countries have very limited uh, influence on the Taliban. For example, the Taliban have always been very keen on, I mean, the Pakistanis have some way of influencing them through the Diobandi networks through the mullahs to the JUI party or parts of JUI, Jamiyat ul islam party, and some madrasas or figures, uh, senior clerics. Uh, but that was more the case during the Taliban first stint in power. 
uh, not this time around. They are not very keen on like going back and even like there are some figures in the Taliban, like the Taliban uh, education uh, minister for higher education. He recently uh, visited Pakistan and went to the Hakania Madrasa. But uh, overall, the Taliban this time around are very keen on the diplomatic level, on the, in the public messaging to kind of distance themselves uh, in that way from Pakistan and to kind of project themselves more as an Afghan national uh, um, uh, organization. Uh, so they are not like, uh, and, and in terms of like Saudis, I don't think that the Saudi government at this point is really interested in influencing the Taliban. I, I see that uh, UAE has perhaps more interest, but that their interest and is largely um, related to and limited to perhaps the priority is their um, uh, competition with Qatar. It's not true that they want to take on the project of transforming, somehow transforming Afghanistan. And that's where the real problem is that the international, uh, I mean, these countries are not trying to, uh, and, and then of course, Southeast Asia is too far. They've never had any major role in Afghanistan. Turkey also initially uh, toyed with this idea of, for example, leaving behind a limited force or somehow support. And third, Turkey, of course, has this other interest of, for example, looking after the Turkic uh, ethnic groups, the interests of the Turkic ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Um, uh, so it's it still is hosting a lot of political uh, figures from the opposition of a former government. So, but they are not again uh, investing anything substantial in trying to transform the Taliban or change their mind. Qatar is the only country that has, to a degree, been successful. But I think Qatar's uh, uh, efforts are broadly limited to uh, this kind of behind the scene role of um, uh, enabling the Taliban to directly talk to the West. And that was, was the first the, um, negotiations with the Americans. And now again, Qatar is being used as a venue for exchanging um, views between the Taliban and various primarily um, uh, governments. I think that the Taliban this time around have a very good uh, direct a contact with many countries um, in the region and in the Western, but there are things that for the Western countries, for example, it's very difficult to sell to their own audiences to do in their domestic politics. It will be a big problem to sell the idea of recognizing the Taliban or somehow uh, seen as helping the Taliban um, uh, when the Taliban uh, are not allowing, for example, teenage girls to go back to school in many regions. Uh, and, and then, of course, the big problem, the big complexity is uh, th this whole notion of uh, helping the Taliban, um, helping, trying to help the Afghan in a way that you don't help uh, the Taliban. Um, I mean, many Western uh, experts are now arguing for more engagement with, with the Taliban, finding ways, even recognition of the Taliban or something like that, in a way to help to avert this humanitarian crisis. Um, and, and there is some There's that other question, you know, as uh, an Afghan participant, would you like to to tackle that? The, the point is, is the world then talking to the right people? Do the Taliban uh, leaders have uh, an, an adequate connect with their own foot soldiers in far flung areas? I think they have, I mean, they have, um, I think more or less control over their organization. They are more disciplined than any other organization. They can enforce the thing, but they cannot be seen. The, the political dilemma for them is that they cannot abandon uh, for, for whatever the uh, propagated for 20 years to be fighting for. For example, I mean, they never fought for, they fought for a united Afghanistan, so that's, something they fought only for Afghanistan their revolution is not transnational but that's something that they can defend but they cannot uh, sell for example a secular Afghanistan to their base and that's not something that the leader will ever um, um, accept but are, are you are you trying to then say that the Taliban would fall between two stools if they tried to you know have their cake and eat it too I mean if the Chinese can uh, adopt uh, 
their model of governance as uh, the epitome and pinnacle uh, of democracy today, uh, as seen in their white paper, uh, what prevents the Taliban from also making such adjustments to meet the uh, requirements of the international community? I mean, I've given you the example that the after Taliban. all these years, the Chinese model of governance, uh, a single party monolithic authoritarian system of the Communist Party of China is selling itself in its white paper as epitomizing the pinnacle of the bloom of democracy. If there is on earth democracy in its fullest bloom, the Chinese are telling us today, that's in Beijing. So this kind of you know co-option of what the world wants, what prevents the Taliban from understanding that? I mean, by all accounts, they're intelligent people. And by all accounts, uh, they have negotiated very intelligently with the United States. Well, the Taliban, uh, I think, have a major dilemma, and I don't know, I mean, how they're going to balance it. They are ruling over a country that's one of the world's poorest and most aid-dependent countries. So they want to, I mean, every day I see them um, talking to people and appealing for international aid, um, talking about unfreezing their assets, for example, that have been frozen by the United States. But at the same time, they are not doing enough to address the very basic thing. The basics are really clear. One basic thing is let the Afghan people have normal lives. Let the girls let, all let, let, let me let me let me uh, bring in. So one of our panelists wants to jump in here. And uh, uh, since we don't have two, uh, we have a little time on our hands. Uh, so let me bring in Mr. Bahir here. Uh, I'll, of course, go to Dr. Aisha Siddiqui also. Uh, um, so, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Please, please uh, stay in here and you may also comment on all that has been indicated in the Q&A box. So I will. I will. Just with, with regards to uh, the Taliban and trying to understand them, I think um, it's important for us to understand how religious extremist groups work as well. Um, the idea, the typical view of rationality that you and I have isn't shared by them. And that can be seen in the way they fight and the way that they engage in politics. Now, with regards to fighting, you and I, if we are engaged in a military campaign, we very often make a battle assessment. We look at our current victories, current losses, and projected future outcomes. And based on that, we make a decision. The problem with religious extremist groups is that they do not look at tangible uh, physical limitations the way you and I do. So the idea is that there are always Valkyries that would land from the sky to support them. They would always be God's support, even if the nation is starving. And this is not just me making this up because you can see statements from the Taliban leadership saying, well, God has promised to feed us all, so he will feed us, right? Which means that the whole rationale of cost benefit analysis sometimes goes out of the window. The second thing, and this is with regards to why we do not see conformity or sensible behavior at times from the Taliban. The Taliban are struggling with consolidating their own power. What does that mean? That means uh, for an insurgent group that was such a fluid insurgency, as Antonio Gastuzzi would call it, for them to turn into an actual organization that is structured and has rank and file, it is becoming problematic. For example, and for those of you who have engaged with the Taliban would know, it's very difficult to identify who to talk to within the Taliban for specific matters, because everyone is choosing to go to a specific address, to a specific subgroup and rely on them. We've seen the Chinese rely heavily on the Haqqani network and, and provide their aid and funding to, through them, um, and so on and so forth. Now, the Taliban, though, are trying to create a central body that is authoritative, a central um, way of controlling their ranks. But even the killing of um, previous um, Afghan Defense Forces members, despite the amnesty pr promised, has all been people falling out of line. There's a lot of roguish behavior amongst their elements. And it's going to take time for the Taliban to turn into a more cohesive organization. So that's one limitation. With regards to the question posed here. So let, let, me, let me just draw you out there. So then in, in a sense, you're also suggesting that there has to be a certain amount of bloodletting internal 
uh, you know, sort of reconciliation of contradictions before the Taliban get to convert themselves from what they truly were, which is an insurgency to uh, being, uh, you know, a government with some structures with a, a clearly unchallenged and defined leadership. I mean, we, we've seen that in the case of the Chinese also. Mm. When the Communist Party of China came to power, it yeah. came through, uh, you know, a certain degree of violence and bloodshed. But then along that journey, Mao had established his, his you know, supremacy, uh, you know, even before uh, the People's Republic of uh, China was founded in 1949. So uh, are we then Bastard, this, the is, this is a teething problem, right? So when a baby initially gets their teeth, they itch, right? And, and it's painful. So this whole painful process of growth uh, is there. The problem is here again with regards to proxies, as long as we keep finding elements within the Taliban and investing in them and putting them against each other's throats to make sure that the element that we prefer ends up being in prime supreme power, we're going to keep on causing more and more problems. Unless the Taliban naturally within themselves acquire a certain consolidation of power, we will just see further disintegration amongst their rank and file. They've been really good at covering it up, not showing it, but it does exist. There is tension because, again, the foot soldier that fought in a, because they weren't in an institutionalized organization, which means there was no respect for rank and file. A lot of the times the Taliban fail at governances because when the central authorities give a command to the governors, the governors don't pay heed. The governors give commands to the district uh, representatives. They don't pay heed. So no one's really falling in line. So in, in, that that case, case, can, in that case, can it be done by the Taliban creating a regular army, which is disciplined, which is professional, not just the accoutrements of uh, wearing comically what the Americans have left behind, you know, in terms of uh, uniforms and uh, uh, cameras and and uh, using the same M16 rifles and all, but genuinely uh, in 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 the mind being disciplined regular soldiers. Will that help? I mean, one of the, the of the previous regime was the lack of institutions to begin with, right? So the fact that if the Taliban have any hope of not becoming a failed state, they would have to build institutions and invest in them, and there has to be some sort of constitutionalism for those who act roguishly, they should be brought in and put in front of a justice system. Those things are currently missing, but the Taliban's excuse for that being missing is the lack of time that they've had and all the limitations that, that have been put upon them. Now, and this answers the question that uh, Harpreet has posed as well, is the problem with Afghanistan right now is we do have peace, but it's a negative peace. It's a peace that solely relies on the absence of large-scale fighting. It is not a positive piece that is bringing benefit to the population. Um, and it, it is a transformational moment. Um, uh, if you look at Ladakh's literature, uh, they say that uh, when countries come out of conflict and enter some sort of post-conflict state, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to either build things in a new, better way or just do things worse than they were being done before. And the Taliban really... It, the problem, and, and this summarizes most of what I'm saying, the pre pejorative lies with the Taliban. Unless the Taliban are willing to act more rationally, unless the Taliban are willing to deal with their limitations in a smarter way, unless the Taliban are, have a long-term plan, nothing is going, nothing you and I can do. We might be able to push them a little to modify behavior, but at the end of the day, the sole initiative lies with the Taliban as to whether they can maximize and capitalize on that moment. It's up to them. I do also uh, want to comment on who the uh, is, uh, Taliban figures were who first entered the presidential palace. That, that was a question. I, I mean, uh, for one of the reasons why the Haqqani network got the leverage that they did on the negotiating table was because Kabul fell to them. Uh, the fact that the, the Haqqani network's fighters from Logar entered from the south of Kabul and a lot of the members that entered from the north, from Pagman's side, were loyalists to them, meant that the Kabul takeover was majorly conducted by the Haqqani network, which is why they had that leverage to negotiate a bigger chunk within the regime. At the end of the day, numbers-wise, the Haqqani aren't as big, but if you look at the cabinet structure, close to 15 ministers belong to their network to begin with. So um, that those were the people that went into Kabul first. 
Okay, and now I want to now move to uh, Dr. Aisha Siddiqui. Uh, so, I mean, you've actually heard all that your co-panelists have said. Uh, so, I'm sure there's a lot that, uh, you know, is, is going through your mind as well with your vast experience and understanding of the region. Uh, so, kindly take the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. A couple of things that I want to uh, kind of comment on. Um, but, you know, in a way, I would like to ask a counter question. And the counter question is, why are we, why in India uh, and, and the world at large is in a hurry to expect, uh, you know, a higher level of democratization from, uh, from the Taliban when democracy is getting pushed around all over the world. I mean, just because the United States holds a democracy conference does not mean that, uh, you know, uh, democracy is in a good shape in wherever uh, it's, you know, wherever the uh, you know, United States is engaged with the rest of the world. Uh, I think there are a couple of things which are important. Um, you, the Afghanistan stands at the horn of a dilemma. One is that in order to stabilize, firstly, I think the comparison between the previous uh, Taliban regime and now, it's important to uh, understand that while the world was coming around to engaging with it, then they had kind of established power much more smoothly during the 1990s. It was a different regime. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I would uh, kind of shudder to use the term more pragmatic or less pragmatic. I think uh, they were using violence, they were using force, and they had a constituency. That constituency still remains there. And, uh, you know, which which is ideologically poised, which has a certain understanding of social culture. Uh, now, it's so interesting that from, uh, you know, General Nick Carter down to Zalme Khalilzad have been talking about uh, Pakhtun Wali, uh, their own interpretation or their own understanding of what Pakhtun Wali is, but their explanation so brings in the ideological factor. You know, there is an understanding even in the United States, why the United States was uh, negotiating that ideology is going to be part of what whatever uh you know taliban but, but let, let, let me stop you on that see if ideology has played such a big part all along and is still playing such a big part then uh you know one can harken back to the time that uh, the taliban actually acquired that ideology in you know mosques in the afpac area particularly along the pakistani side of uh you know, the, the AFPAC areas. Now, why cannot uh, the same kind of ideological, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, doctrination or indoctrination today, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, de-radicalize them somewhat in keeping with the times because they've got it through the, the mosques in the AFPAC areas. And so let the mosques in Afghanistan uh, tell them a different narrative today. Why is that not possible? I think, Ambassador, you're in a, uh, you seem to be in a bit of a hurry to, uh, you know, to expect a, a, a change there. I think you need a, perhaps a different session on what different forms of radicalization are uh, throughout the Muslim world. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a different subject. Uh, you see, over, over, over years, that radicalization, that understanding of religion and ideology, which has evolved, it may have been Saudi money, but it's not necessarily all of Saudi ideology. A lot of it is very homegrown. And when I say homegrown, I mean the AFPAC region, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, let, let, let me, for example, pitch in and say that even ISKP is not foreign. The concept behind it is not foreign. Uh, for instance, uh, let me argue that you know, uh, ISKP, Khorasan, the region of Khorasan, Afghanistan being very central to Khorasan, but it includes Pakistan, it includes Northern India, is identified historically as a region from where the forces 
of good will join the forces uh, in, in, in the Middle East uh, once there is a final battle between the end of the world. Now, that is so inherent and in, 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 and, uh, in, in, in the ideology, in the historical lessons. And, and so Khorasan is very important that way. So the, the reason I'm, I'm explaining all of that is that, uh, you know, it's not just foreign Saudi ideology. There, there is, it's, it's very homegrown as well. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's Saudi funny. So Saudi Arabia changing does not necessarily mean that this region is, is going to change. I think. But was it Pakistani ideology? Would you say it was Pakistani ideology that they were indoctrinated? No, 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 no. It's not just Pakistani. It's North Indian, Pakistani, you know, this entire belt. Uh, and, and that ideology is, is, is there. I mean, if you look at. Uh, some of the works by Seema Alavi, for example, you would understand how northern northern India has a lot of influence, actually, and, and I would say northern India, including Pakistan, has a lot of influence on actually shaping up uh, Saudi ideology as well. I mean, uh, would it surprise you if I tell you that, uh, in fact, the teacher of uh, uh, Abdul Wahab, uh, you know, who, who, who established, who created the Bahaism actually was from Sindh. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's independent, interconnected, et cetera, et cetera. As were some of the earliest preachers in Afghanistan, they came from the Punjab. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, that is there. So, you know, you can't, you cannot erase it. It will go away gently if it has to go away. The point I think I'm, I'm trying to make is that the, you know, go towards is, uh, if you, you know, uh, let me finish is that. Afghanistan right now under the Taliban is at a point where on the 1 challenge is how to establish control. Uh, how to push back other forces, which compete with them. That's 1 challenge, but I think what is encouraging is that they're also in engaging with the rest of the world. Uh, from from United States to China to Russia to to even India, they're talking. Uh, they're, it's not just a negative, you know, we'll kill you, we'll fight you kind of a conversation. Now it can go two ways. Something which we have not discussed at all in this entire session is, for example, the possibilities. I mean, the the economic crunch is so intense, right? If people have to be fed, and if the pressure comes. Let's not forget that there is a large drug industry, uh, which can, which they can revert to. I mean, if everything else fails and, and, and we're then looking at another, another danger. So it's a question which the, uh, with the Taliban are posing to the world as well. I mean, do you want people to starve? Do you want, uh, you know, you know, drug, uh, you know, proliferation to, to, to begin? So you're. You know, there, it's not just our responsibility, it's your responsibility, uh, you know, as well. Now, one, one last point that I want to, in my time, uh, quickly uh, draw your attention towards. I think what we have not looked at is how is the region and how is global forces dealing with, a, with you know, with, with, a, with the Taliban issue? Do we have a consensus? Uh, is there a coming together? And the answer is no. United States has left the region, but uh, you know, the, one of the arguments that I've I've, I've heard uh, being made is that uh, now it's it's a situation where uh, you know there is a bit of a self satisfaction in Washington because while the Taliban are there. It's also a problem that they have left behind with the, for the Chinese and Russian to deal deal with, uh, and and as you've noticed, China and Russia both have not been uh, too excited, too eager to come in, dump all their money and resources, come and claim. Uh, you know, we keep hearing about uh, you know copper mines and 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 uh, you know other other mineral resources that China is interested in of course it is interested in all this uh, all these resources but is it ready to dump uh, right its resources right now and the answer is no it's 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 sit and wait which is which is important i think uh, the taliban are looking at that sit and wait so while they're not too eager to democratize 
to change their system. They're not in a hurry to do that. But I think it's going to be slow and incremental and that engagement will come about. The engagement will come about, has to come about, you know, even if you don't like it. Uh, I think the world will engage with, even if it is to minimize, reduce the possibility of terrorism emanating from this region, you still need an engagement. That will happen. And and one final point is, I think, please, I mean, I would like panelists, fellow panelists to also comment, but, you know, uh, for, for you to think about it, that when there is overall radicalization happening throughout South Asia, there's not a single country where religious right and the right wing is not strengthening. And where democracy in South Asia uh, has little to say, stand up for itself and say that, you know, uh, we are very dem democratic. It's not a single country which can claim that. Now, with that in perspective, uh, to, why to expect so much from the Taliban? Of course, that will change. So why not engage? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, those were, of course, very helpful remarks. Uh, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr Siddiqui wants to uh, chip in here with uh, a couple of points. And before I really bring this to an end on time, uh, I will certainly give the floor to uh, Mr. Abu Bakr Siddiqui. Uh, so you can have uh, a, a final word if you if you like. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I just have like, I mean, just to uh, leave some question to ponder over. I think when talking about Afghanistan, we should realize that we are talking about a part of the world, this unique country in the world that has faced three state uh, collapses or three state failures in the past century. The first failure was um, the collapse of what uh, King, uh, reformist King Amanullah Khan uh, started in earlier 20th century, one of the most modern, ambitious, uh, state building project in the entire Muslim world when the Muslim world, most of the Muslim world was then of but course, of course uh, a great deal of unease was felt uh, and, and problems at the popular level simply seeing the photograph of uh, his yeah, exactly his, I mean part, part, part of that was not because of, part was that was because the British wanted him to fail so he failed and the British were a much bigger uh, uh, power then. And then, of course, the second state failure was in 1992 and the third one is now. And we should not, I mean, the Taliban alone, uh, of course, are neither uh, equipped, they are not uh, organized enough and they are not ambitious enough. I mean, the, all they know is to work for implementing what they think is a pure Islamic system. And that will not, of course, it address um, uh, what is Afghanistan state building challenges? They have tried to be flexible in their mind. They have they are being tremendously flexible. But the question is, is that enough both for the domestic or Afghan audiences and for the international uh, community? And the key thing here is that when the population started, uh, the population is already suffering in unimaginable ways. I mean, just look at the the amount of exodus, the, the amount of the number of people trying to leave Afghanistan, the exodus is unbelievable. So the first priority, I think, in thinking about Afghanistan and doing something about Afghanistan is first to prioritize um, uh, addressing the humanitarian situation, help with the collapsing economy, and then, of course, with all the things, and, and that is something that there has to be a lot of give and take. And I think one of the key things that I have seen as an observer, as somebody reporting on this, is that the problem with Afghanistan is that it's, re it's regional, regional countries, its neighbors, regional powers, they often prioritize, and global powers, they often uh, prioritize their own uh, very narrow interest over larger in, uh, interests of peace, security, and state building in, in that country. Thank you very much. Uh, that truly brings us to the end of uh, what I would regard as a wonderful, uh, you know, kickoff uh, to our event, uh, the first session. Uh, and um, I want to thank all the panelists for their very, very useful, enlightening comments. Uh, certainly, this has uh, given us more food for thought. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, another uh, wonderful session later today on uh, perspectives on Afghanistan. 
you are all aware of the program uh, and uh, we will also continue this uh, discussion uh, tomorrow as well with uh, uh, two more sessions tomorrow. Uh, with all that, uh, uh, I think we might uh, end up having a little more clarity. The first session, of course, has injected a certain amount of clarity, but it's also uh, left us with a lot of questions. And one big banner uh, before us uh, says uncertainty. And so hopefully this will, you know, the clouds will lift as we continue with the discussion. With that, I thank you all for bearing with me as chair. Uh, it was a, a, a great privilege for me to, to be with such eminent speakers today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you.